2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, it speaks about the coming apostasy. And uh, I think we're right square down in the middle of everything that Paul wrote about, Timothy wrote about. My mind always goes back to 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their uh, evil ways, seek my face, he says, I will heal their land, I will hear from heaven. It's easy to turn the TV on and see the Bible, Scripture being fulfilled. Even if you do not, do not believe uh, the apostolic faith, you have to acknowledge that this thing is, is uh, coming to pass just as the Word said. The biggest controversy the Lord has had to deal with almost from the beginning has been church people. Church people. The church. Brother Dean taught an excellent scripture, and I thought, Brother Dean, you're right on my message this morning. I like it when it's like that. That uh, a lot of things that's going on sometimes is not because of what we call the devil working, even, even though he is, but it's because the church it's not being the church as it should be. The Lord fashioned the church like a, a vessel that's indestructible. Indestructible, nothing formed against the true church is going to uh, bring the church down. But there's uh, people in the church. There's people in people because the people are the church. But there's uh, also people in what we call the church that will cause a lot of the, the uh, what we call churches to implode from within. And I was reading this scripture that I'm going to share with you today. I was reading it a few days back, and, and I, I got a thought from it. I thought, Lord, I had never really seen it like that before, but yet I have. And uh, Brother Bobby, I've been praying for you. I'm going to stop just a minute. I've been praying for you. Because uh, I know in part what you're going through. I don't know entirely, but I know just enough. When you lose a, a, your companion, uh, you, you lose part of yourself. And you feel the effects of it. It's like you've had surgery, and the surgeon took out part of your heart. And you're, you're surviving on just part of what's left. But I've been praying for you. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want you to really listen to this. Then know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. That means dangerous. That means trouble. Perilous times shall come in the last days. And if we're not careful, we will think about the rioters. We will think about those people that's destroying property. We'll think about people taking someone else's life. We'll, we'll think about all that we see. You know, it just seems like they want to burn America down. If we're not careful, we'll think about that as being the perilous times it is in part. However, that is not what this is talking about, and I'll read it to you. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, I want you to listen to this. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, to parents unfaithful, unholy. You know, they're talking now about Netflix, Netflix, what you want to call it, that's uh, airing these, uh, this movie called The Cuties, and it has to do with child pornography, really. Yeah. That's what it's dealing with. Yeah. And, and you know how they're legalizing pedophilia and... Uh, Le just legalizing everything that's filthy. But you know a true child of God, if it's legal or, or not, will not protect. You don't have to legalize sin that's right. uh, to keep yeah. people from sinning. That's right. Because if it's in your heart to sin, you're going to sin, right. law or no law. Amen. But if you're a child of God and your heart, mind, and soul is covered by the blood, regardless of how they legalize everything, you're not going to be a partaker anyway. Right. Okay. But here, what brought on the perilous times that, that we read about? It said, men shall be lovers of their own selves. In other words, self-centered. 
Pulled everything to see. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. If I've ever seen a generation of un unthankful young people, we're seeing that. They're not thankful that, that they've got a roof over their head, shelter, clothing, food. They're not thankful. If they were, they wouldn't be out somewhere rioting. They'd be at home. They'd be working somewhere, making money to help provide for their family. But you know, we're in a generation now that it's not like it was when I was growing up, like you was growing up. It's mm -hmm. entirely different. But because of this, the writer said there would be perilous times. Did you know from what I'm reading here, part of the reason for perilous times is because of church people? I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, we talked about that, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, how do I know that's having to do with what we call church people? It said having a form of godliness. I read that the other day, and I took a second look. I thought, Lord, over the years, I have kind of thought that that perilous times was the cause of people breaking the law. I thought perilous times was because someone got on a rampage, you know, with a, a, a weapon and began to go on a shooting spree. I thought perilous times was people that just, you know, uh, wanted to get out and, and destroy somewhere, somewhere else. I thought that was the perilous time, and it was, would come from a demonic, soaked people. But this was talking about people that had a form of godliness that he was speaking about. I've just read it to you. He wasn't talking about the right sinners out here. He was talking about a people that had a form of godliness, but denying the power that thereof. And he said, from search, such turn away. For of that sort are they which creep into houses and, and lead captive silly women laden with sins and away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is speaking about people that have a form of godliness but do not have power. Just having a form, and so many churches have a form. If we're not careful, we'll have just a form of worship. In other words, uh, maybe two psalms, prayer, a uh, little teaching, two more psalms, you know, a little bit more something than a message. And if we're not careful, we're, we're going to be in a form, just a different form. But here it's speaking about a form of, of righteousness, but no power. The church world is not walking in the power that the Lord wants us to walk in. Now, if you would describe a, a person that's supposed, supposed to be what we call church people, and you said you, and you began to describe them as, well, you know, some of them, they're just lovers of themselves. Some of them are they're disobedient to parents. They're, they're just ungrateful for everything. If you're not careful, you're going to describe somebody in the church. But it's said that this would be a people having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And it said, from search, turn away. I began to think about the churches in the Bible that we read about when it spoke about them being in church. And I thought about Peter one day. He was in prison and probably saw no way out. But it said the church was praying. The church was praying. The church was praying. Yes, and because the church was praying, yes. the Lord sent an angel and unlocked the prison doors. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. And the servant of God got out, Amen. being led out by an angel of God. I mean, why? Because there was a people called the church that could pray such a prayer. That could pray such a prayer that an angel, a better friend, 
they had open heart surgery about two months back and they pronounced him dead I think a couple of times and his family thought he was gone but you know what from somewhere in a, another realm there was an angel showed up in Dipsy Howard's room at the hospital and even though his heart had exploded it's my understanding his heart had split. But you know what? Mercy showed up from another world. Grace showed up and stood by my friend's bedside. Began to touch him. Bathe his brow. And he said he felt something supernatural take over. And he felt death leave his body. You know, somewhere there's still people called the church that can get a hold of God, that can get a hold of the supernatural and what could have been death, life. Raise that man up from the death bed. He's the church today. Praise God. Is the church necessary in our day? Yes, it is. I need each one of you that's here today. And hopefully y'all need me. Amen. But the average church does not have enough travailing people, praying people, intercessors, that can get a hold of the mercy of God and the grace of God and bring in a supernatural presence then I guess to push the death angel back and just say, let my servant go. We need to pray to God that somehow that you, that I could be a part of what I'm going to call the praying church. That when I need supernatural intervention that I would know who to call on in the time of need. Now, who would you call on just run off in the time of need? Now, there's a lot of people that have a form of godliness, but they have no power. They have no authority in the Lord. To me, power doesn't mean being able to pick up a two-ton bar. Power is having authority in that name. Yes. Power is having authority through the blood of the Lamb. Power is having the kind of Holy Ghost that when you call on that name, that all heaven backs up your authority in that name. Yes, amen. A lot of people are using that name, but they have no authority in it. Come on now. Yes. Having a form of Jesus. godliness but denying the power thereof from such don't have anything to do with it. I've shared with you different times how several years back I was going to meet Marie Jackson and Owen. I was going to go with them to a church across town to listen to a visiting preacher. On the way up the interstate, something began to come against me physically and I thought I was going to die right there on the interstate. But I made it to Shonis out on White Bit Bridge Road, and I pulled in. When I pulled in that parking lot, it was almost empty. But I thought I was on my way out. You see, when you think, feel like that you're on your way out, and I had left my cell phone at home, I had no way to call anyone. I, I just, it was me and, and mercy. It was just me and grace. But I pulled up and showed this parking lot and all the way across the parking lot I saw this van. There was a man that got out of that van. Black gentleman. As loud as I could holler, I got his attention. I said, Sir, do you know how to pray? I didn't say what church do you Come on now, believe man. do you belong to? I didn't say, have you been baptized? How were you baptized? Come on. 
Come on, brother. Amen. I didn't say do you speak in tongues. Street, that's right. You know what I Hallelujah. asked him? I said, do you know how to pray? Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. I've seen people that can speak in tongues. They don't have no faith. Come on now. Amen. I've seen people boast, you know, about being baptized, got the Holy Ghost, and that's good. But they didn't have any faith. You give me somebody that's got faith if they've never spoken tongues. Y'all may disagree with me, but no. faith is something over and above. Yes, Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. But I said, Kat, do you know how to pray? He said, yes, ma'am, I do. Hallelujah. He came up to me and he laid that big old hand on my forehead. Praise God. And right there and showed his parking lot. You see, I didn't care who was watching Amen. I needed someone that knew how to pray. Yes. Amen. Not just pray, but have faith in God. It's one yes. thing to pray, That's but it's right. another thing to have faith when you pray. That's right. But I want you to know the Lord worked for me. But he got to telling me, he said, I'm a deacon from my church. And just a few weeks back, he said, my nephew, I think he said, was dying. But he said, we prayed, and the Lord raised my nephew up from the death bed. Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. So when I said, do you know how to pray? He could say yes, because he had just seen the miracle working power of the living God. Now, when we say, do you have faith? That, that's a tricky question. My faith is not in me, but my faith is in the God that I serve. So if someone says, do you have faith when you pray? Have faith in the word, not faith in the person. Have faith in God. Yeah. Never one time did he tell us to have faith in ourselves. He said, have faith in God. Yes. Amen. But denying the power thereof. Deny having a form of godliness. In other words, it looks good, it sounds good, it feels good, but it doesn't have any authority in it. I've got a bowl of apples on my table at home. So many times I've had people come in and they'd look at that bowl of apples. And one person looked, one time actually picked it up. He's going to take a bite of it. But it didn't look good. It looked real. But it's the artificial apple. But it looks real. It's pretty. The reason I have it on my table is it looks pretty sitting on my table. And it's color. But it's, it's, it's not real. You know, I'd rather have a handful of people that I feel like is real under pressure under pressure, just be real. I feel like the Lord can take someone that's not as per per perfect as we think they should be, but you know, they can have faith. Amen. I've seen people that wasn't as quote, sanctified as they we thought they should be, but you know, they had faith. Yeah. They had faith. They believed. Amen. The Lord honors faith. The Lord honors faith. He said, well, I'll find faith when I return. Amen. But to get back to having a form of godliness, but no power. I think that we're in the end time and it could be, should be our purpose in life. Lord, I'm going to press my way in with you. And Lord, I'm going to walk like Paul in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. There's more Holy Ghost people filled with the Holy Ghost. With less power, I feel like that I've seen in all my born days. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. I thought the other day 
in my younger days, several in our family, and very seldom were we ever taken to a doctor. But both my parents were old time Holy Ghost filled preachers. And you know what they would do? They would leave us at home sick in the bed. But they would leave us with the older brothers. I don't have any older sisters. I'm the oldest one. But they would leave me at home with my older brothers. And they'd say, you take care of her till we get back. We're going to church. But while they were at church, they would pray. And while they were at church, God healed me of that situation. And I'm healed today. Now, they didn't have a fine, fancy church. Basically, all they had was an old two before altar. But they were faithful to that altar. You know, we're, we're in the day now, there's, there's not much faithfulness to the things of God. Having a form, but no power. No power. For me, and I would hopefully, this congregation, you know uh, the seasons are changing naturally and physically, spiritually. The seasons are changing. But I would like to think that as the season changes, that our season in the Lord will change. And that we begin to go before the Lord and, and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I've been preaching. I've been hearing messages of deliverance all my life. And Lord, I would like to come into a season of seeing more deliverance. More salvation. Yes. Yes. More infilling yes. of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Job said it like this. He said, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Hallelujah. I had several years back, y'all remember when uh, Cheryl's little grandson was coming here, a little afflicted boy. What was his name? Caleb. 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 He was uh, eight or nine years of age and little fella had some kind of a, an affliction, but he liked to, he liked to dance with others when the people get to shouting, little Caleb wanted to shout too. This particular service, I took little Caleb by the hand and, and I got to dancing with him. Just, you know, it, worshiping and dancing before the Lord, I was holding the little fellow's hand. And, but someone took a picture of that. And when they showed me the picture, I saw what a change that takes place when we're getting this pulpit. While we're worshiping, praising, while you're teaching, brother, there's a change that takes place that you don't see when you step up here. Amen. But someone took a picture of that. In that picture, it showed me, and I had on a mitre. I had on a priestly uh, breastplate. Like you see in pictures, you know, that, that apron they've got on, yeah. the, the breastplate, yeah. I had that on. Little Caleb had on little Jewish boy's uh, skull cap, a little Jewish boy's outfit. In the natural, you didn't see that. We didn't see that in the natural. But you see in the spirit realm, while we were praised and worshiping, we were clothed yes. different. Yes. 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 We yes. were clothed yes. different. Yes. Yes. As I've shared with you so many times, when you get to praise it, you, you change garments. Amen. You change garments. You don't know it. You don't feel it, maybe. Thank you, Lord. But there's a change of garments. I was going to the house the other day, and I was kind of feeling heavy, Brother Bobby. It was hard for me to it was hard for me to worship. I said, Lord, I know what the word said. 
I know the answer. You said to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, but I said, Lord, I, I really don't know how to do that. I was honest. I didn't feel like putting on a garment of praise. I didn't feel like laying aside that garment of heaviness. I was so beat down mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I felt about that high. So I said, Lord, I don't feel like it. We thought the praise is just a hallelujah, just, you know, just a, but no. Just start saying, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for the blood. Lord, I thank you for your name. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Ghost. Lord, I thank you for the mercy seat. God, I just thank you. Thank you, Lord. And the first thing you know, you've changed garments and don't even know it. Hallelujah. I've seen that garment of praise. Hallelujah. I have. So I'm saying this, brother, when you step on this pulpit, there's a change of garment. And if we could see the supernatural realm, we'd see the change. I, I've seen that change before. When we're uh, just worshiping with all of our might, if you could see yourself one time in the garment that you, you got on and don't know it, it would encourage you. It would encourage you whew, to lift those hands high. Yes, amen. To exalt that name. You see, I, I know what I'm talking about because I saw it. But that form of godliness, I feel like the end time church is too much in a form of godliness with no power. Just a form with no power. Now they look godly. They might have sounded godly. But somewhere they were denying the power of a godly life. There's something about that that's full of power and authority. But the point that I want to bring out is this. And I hadn't thought of it exactly like this. But part of the being in perilous times is because of the lack of commitment from the church. Surrender to the Almighty God. Because it said there was people that loved themselves more than they loved God. Talking about false accusers, we've all experience that. Uh, despisers of those that are good. I mean, this is talking about church. Said so they're, they're traitors. They're heavy high-minded. I'm talking about the church.